A morning can start better than being able to film marvelous colorful birds. Can it? Let me introduce you to a pair of little green pigeons. This is day nine of my amazing travel in Saba, Borneo. And I'm still in the Sepilog forest area, one and a half more days. Today it's a little bit cloudy, fortunately, because yesterday it was really warm. I thought I had already presented you these on my previous film, but these types of green pigeons can quickly be mistaken if you don't notice the little differences in the plumage colorization. On my previous days I was able to observe the pink neck green pigeons, where males are good to be identified by their indeed pink neck feathers, whereas these little green pigeon males have distinct maroon red wings. Little green pigeons are also less common than the pink necked ones. I'm filming these beautiful pigeons on a very early morning in the Sepilog Forest Edge Resorts Park area and this little group is breakfasting on little green berries. Their distinct white irises are remarkable and combined with the way they clamber along branches they do more remind me of colorful large parrots. These little green pigeons are originally found on the Thai Malay Peninsula, Sumatra, Java and Borneo. They are most common in lowland, where they live in forest parks, gardens and secondary groves up to 400 meters and some of them have well adapted to human settlements. You may typically see them in small flocks of up to 8 birds in which they forage on fruits like wild figs. Little is known about their breeding. A female is feeding on another kind of red fruit capsule on an adjacent shrub that looks a bit like a rhododendron and her partner thought to check them out as well. It seems these little green berries are just more suitable for a mouseful. And what can you do better after having a good meal? Of course, take a good nap. But the buff-necked woodpeckers first have to work on their family planning. Work before pleasure.
This male, which is best distinguished from this species female by its red mala stripes, is working hard on the widening of this pair's nest entrance hole, while their huge hollow tree is swinging softly vertical in the wind. Buff-necked woodpeckers are found in many parts of Southeast Asia, from extreme south of Myanmar to Borneo, Sumatra and its smaller islands. Here we find the nominate form. It mainly occurs in mature lowland evergreen rainforests in subtropical and tropical regions, also peat swamps, heath forests, mangroves and old plantations with thickets, dense understory and rotting timber, occasionally found up to 1225 meter. His partner calls from a thicket nearby and most probably had her breakfast first before she took over his turn. A huge number of wild animals are truly dependent on abandoned woodpecker nests for shelter to roost and sleep and especially to raise their young, that most of the woodpeckers worldwide where they occur are the most important birds of their mostly forest habitats. It's finally time for my breakfast. Glad my wife still left me some of these delicious ants. Yummy! This small alignment is just what I need now. You may see them feeding singly like here or in small groups, but often in a pair that stays close in contact to each other even when feeding. And now let's speed up this woodpecker's hammering a bit. This female is undoubtedly having a definite view of perfection. Surprisingly, it's recorded that they may only lay two eggs. But hey, the hard work shouldn't be all done by the ladies, so enough for now. I give the line to my partner again. Once again, this bird is also threatened by habitat loss, so it's listed as near threatened as well. On my Saba trip I haven't come across many insects, surprisingly, besides butterflies, that this huge yellowish locust was a pleasant found.
I estimated it to be about 6 cm long and I guess it had just been taking its breakfast by nibbling this leaf here instead of consuming ants. A yellow vented flower packet just releases a water drop, the result of drinking lots of fruit juice that it managed to squeeze out of these green berries. Once the juice is gone, it simply lets the berries drop. This species is an uncommon resident of subtropical and tropical moist lowland and mountain forests. This very pleasant cast took good care about me, making sure I wouldn't eat too much at the resort's restaurant. It's a greater green leaf bird male that frequented the fruiting shrubs planted around the restaurant daily in search of the shrub's berry-sized fruits to pick and squeeze one fruit after another. These leaf birds have the best songs of all the leaf birds in their region, enriched by the ability to also mimic other birds. Sometimes you may mistaken their calls for the oriental magpie robins, which themselves also mimic other bird songs. Often lesser and greater leaf birds are occurring in the same area, even seen together on the same fruiting tree, so identifying can be quite difficult when you only see the males that quite much look alike and you don't see their more distinguishable females around. Greater leaf birds are also rarely visiting gardens, they are more found in the forest canopies. So how lucky I was, this male made an exception to entertain me. Generally they live in the middle story of forest and forest edges and tall secondary growths up to 1200 meter. Today it's a little bit cloudy, fortunately, because yesterday it was really warm. My friend is trying to find the honey guide. And I will find some other birds, maybe the makula. There will be more on my list today, so let's see if I can find it. If you are not a keen birder and well familiar with rarities, you might most probably more love about a scenery like this. They are waiting for the honey guide, which is located, hopefully, later in this tree. Where well, you have the Honey! So, Alvin, you have found your next lifer? Yes, yes. Which yes. was that? Actually, it's the honey guide. Been searching around for quite some time. Ah. But, uh, You've never seen lucky. it? Never. Ooh. <laughs> so, just heard about uh, yesterday, the friend said this got the one of the three. Yes, On which we've there, seen already. A, yeah, so With that's the right. large honey web still there. Yeah. yeah. So, the honey guide actually is more. He's eating it. He's eating it. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like he's eating the box as well, yeah, but I don't together. know. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Cool. And uh, you were supposed to not do anything else today, only to get these birds? Yeah. And you just arrived? Yeah. <laughs> click it. Yeah, click. Done. But actually, <laughs> uh, I'm not so satisfied about this. They only have body, you see. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, next round they come, I want to see whole body, then it's considered done. Yeah. Um, yeah. You have any idea if that was male or female? No. I okay. don't really know. First time I see, but I, I can't You think tell. it's a rare species or it's just a difficult species to find? Or? It's very difficult. Mm. Actually, most of the time you heard on me, it's calling, but hardly see. Yesterday I remember <laughs> that you already said, oh, it must be there, but yeah. you couldn't find it. Yeah. Ah, cool. Yep. So that's a great start of day nine of our travel. Yep, yep. yep. <laughs> Let's continue to find more lifers. For me, every bird here is a lifer, for yeah. sure. <laughs> Okay, continue. But I filmed it for you guys and uh, I will show you the film now. My friend Alvin informed his close bird friends about the spectacular found of this honey guide and within one day several of his friends from all over Saba arrived here at RDC and Sandakan to click this high demanded life for bird. The rare and poorly known Malaysian honey guide is a medium sized bird in olive brown with a reddish iris. It occurs throughout lowland broadleaf forests of Western Thailand, Peninsula Malaysia, Borneo and Sumatra and nests in tree hollows. Their diet, they say, consists mainly of insects, especially wild bees and wasps. But this one here is eating completely waxy honeycombs. Wow. 
What a luck, Elvin, huh? Yeah. Good, good. Due to ongoing habitat loss throughout its range and local and sparse populations, the Malaysian honey guide is listed as near threatened on the Yukon Red List of Threatened Species. I finally meet the manager of the park, right? Yes. What's your name? My name is Bernadette Joman, mm -hmm. or you can call me Ben. Ben. Yes. So how long are you working here? I've been working here for about 19 years. Oh, that's a long time. Mm -hmm. How long does this park exist? Um, we've been around since 1996. Mm, okay. Yeah. And uh, this kind of uh, kind of pie walk, when is that built? It was done in stages. So mm -hmm. we started approximately at um, I think 2004, mm -hmm. something like that. Okay. I remember. Uh, so basically, this park runs on um, funding from government and from entrance fee, or how is it all financed? Yes. Um, in terms of development, yes. it's funded by the federal government mm -hmm. of Malaysia okay. through our um, economic yes. plan. And in terms of uh, maintenance, mm -hmm. it's funded by the state government mm -hmm. as well as from the entrance fee. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So how many visitors do you have a day? Well, it can't say. Like during the festive season, like now it's Hari Raya, um, we get a lot of people. Well, for us, like... 500 to maybe 800 people. That's a lot. Okay. But um, on normal days, uh, we get less people. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. What is actually the speciality of this park? I mean, I know it already, but can you describe it to our viewers? Okay. Um, first and foremost, the Rainforest Discovery Center, RDC, is an environmental education center. Yes. Maybe you notice a lot of. Uh, information panels yes. all around RDC, yes. the trail, we have the exhibition hall and everywhere uh, along the trail. Yeah. So that is the main purpose of the center, to educate the visiting public as well as um, students, mm -hmm. school students about the rainforest. Do you get it. some groups where you also do some kind of guiding to educate them? Yes, we do, especially okay. uh, school children. Ah. Yeah, we get a lot of uh, school groups. Well, um, on average, maybe one group per week. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Normally during the weekends. Okay. Um, over here, exactly on this part, yeah. at about six in the evening, yeah. is where we would take people to see the flying squirrel. Yes, yeah. yes. And lots of other squirrels. Mm -hmm. And uh, on birds, we have more than 300 species of birds around here. Especially here. Yes. That's interesting to know. In terms of conservation, basically you can say the whole place is a conservation area because uh, it is protected area, which is a class six uh, according to the forest enactment of Sabah. Class six means it's a virgin jungle reserve and it is protected for especially for education, recreation and research. So um, there's no logging involved over here. Yeah. And added to the environmental education programs that we have, it's all about conserving the forest of Sabah. It's not possible anymore in Sabah to destroy any forest? Is there a no. ban? Okay. Yeah, there so is no a illegal logging, nothing like that? No, not because okay. uh, we have started, uh, we're, we were doing sustainable forest management now. Oh, okay. Since and how many years? Uh, I think it was since uh, 89 we oh, started okay, the okay. project so you're planting trees something or definitely what's going on? okay so when you say sustainable forest management that means the forest is well managed every tree harvested yeah. in that commercial forest has to be accounted for so no trees are lost so in illegal logging well when you say illegal logging 
it all means that people are stealing, right? But a lot of um, patrolling, a lot of um, monitoring is being done by the foresters in order to make sure that we, we stop this illegal logging. Okay. Yeah. So, so there's no forest burning anywhere here anymore in Sabah? Oh, forest burning is due to, um, due to the extreme weather. To the drought? But it's not because they want to put some palm oil forest there? No. Okay, great. Not in Sabah. But forest yeah. plantation. Yeah. Do you think this is one of the most interesting regions of Sabah to visit, actually? One of the most interesting, yes. Okay, okay. I definitely think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah me no, too. Me no too. No need to think so. <laughs> yeah, yes. me too. Since I'm here, I know about it. <laughs> so we would in. really like to invite people to visit your awesome oh, RDC yeah. park. Uh, uh, RDC actually means what? Rainforest Discovery Center. Yes. The, the word discovery itself means for people to yeah. discover things around. And there is so much to discover here. So I really hope that you will have a, a view at our film, my film, our film, and uh, watch this area because it's really worth it. Even if you don't know about wildlife, it's bursting of wildlife and you can just relax. We're still waiting for the honey guide actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks for having you on Thank the Thank you, Kara. The purple flowering shrubs close to the RDC Lakes Bridge were favorited all day by Panteno sylvia butterflies, also called clippers. They're roughly 10 cm in wingspan and seem mainly to be found in the tree canopies, so I might call myself lucky to have been able to film them from close by. Males are highly territorial and chase other males away from their territory. There's lots of subspecies of them in their large range in Southeast Asia. I've seen them on my recent trip to the Philippines already. The Bellymontes is a subspecies found here in Borneo. Flying around all day makes tired. Time to rest a bit. This house swallow looks much like our barn swallows in Europe. Swallows are birds all familiar to us, but how much do we actually know about them? It's perched on a stick place for birds sticking out of the lake and keeps an eye on its surrounding insects and other swallows. I suppose its partner or a family member returned. We can only estimate what a single swallow can eat a day. A study on barn swallows showed that they are able to consume 60 insects per hour, so roughly 850 insects a day. As mosquitoes and flies are making up the main part of their diet, there are also major pest control within their range where wildlife and also us are profiting from.
Best time to be in the park is of course always in the morning and in the evening. Ah. Evan is still waiting for his honey guide, Lifer, and I want to try again for some hornbills. You also love this beautiful bird song in the morning. Indeed, it is enchanting. But also the huge fate of these oriental magpie robins that are still taken from the wild to be sold as favorite cage birds. Yellow vented bulbuls are preening the morning dew out of their feathers. A common bird but a lovely scene to watch while they also preen each other like pigeons do. It is 6 a.m. and as usual there is someone here at the reception. <laughs> you guys are starting early. This is day 10 of my journey, the almost last day in the Sepilog forest in Borneo. And I'm walking the forest trail now, which is on the Sepilog forest edge resort area. <laughs> I'm surrounded by sunbirds and today unfortunately there's a lot of mosquitoes. A lot of flies, so oh, I had to cover myself, I had to go back because they've been biting me everywhere. Some mosquito repellent, and you feel much better. So let's see what the forest trail has to offer. Most trails tend to live more secretive where humans started to live close to their inhabited area. This is not so with the white breasted water hen that is widespread over Southeast Asia, and which is common to see at many lakes and wetland areas within its range. Adults are said to build roost or brood nests where their young and the adults rest. Still, bamboo flutes are used by many hunters to attract it, as it highly responds on these. Good morning, guys. Hi. How are you? We are delighted to bump into you guys again. <laughs> <laughs> good, good to know. Good to know. Enjoy your meal. Yay. Looks quite healthy. Well, yeah. Try to. Mm. There we go. You have good. no idea what's going to happen next. <laughs> mm. Every day is such an amazing breakfast here. Elvin, are you recovered a little bit? Yeah, I think 60-70% now. <laughs> Recharged batteries? Yeah, recharged battery. My battery almost flat. Almost, almost what about Chang? Chang is still on 100%, right? No, 50%. How much? Oh, come on, you're kidding me. You are the master of disaster. So you must have the 100%. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, almost. <laughs> Back in the RDC forest, a new bobo species came to my side. This hairy back bobo shows me once again how graceful some birds are. Here on Borneo occurs a subspecies Veridis that lives in evergreen forests and seems to be a generalist in feeding on fruits and arthropods. It's such a lovely day out there. I could yes. sit every day in the sun, but it's not possible in Europe, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I travel to places like this in the tropics. Yeah, it's very nice to have the sun and cool down a bit to help your 
enjoy a refreshing drink. drink. Refreshing and drink. <laughs> do you have nice weather here? 365 days a year. Um, we have some season. You oh, have season. Yeah, we have okay. season, but not like in Europe. Do you have a winter season? Let's say winter summer something you have or? Oh, uh, winter summer we don't have winter summer. One of the smallest squirrels in the world is this least pygmy squirrel that only measures around 7 cm head to body length and its shorter 4 to 5 cm tail, which only weighs briefly 20 grams. Two or three meters from the other tree to the back to that tree again. That's too amazing. Can't quite believe this squirrel is described to be diurnal while it's running and flipping around and jumping in between the trees while I'm filming it at daytime. It occurs in Borneo on its satellite island Pulau Bangi and is recently also discovered in Sumatra. Predominantly it inhabits lowland and downhill forests but is also recorded up to 1700 meter. It mainly lives on mid-high trees, often in stories more than 12 meter high, where it mainly consumes tree bark and probably its associated lichen. Sometimes it supplements its diet with insects too and other plant parts. super happy I just clicked and filmed my next woodpecker. I was able to capture brilliant films for you which I will show you now. Have a look. A special prominent deserves its special film part and presentation and sometimes interesting details just turn out to be discovered later when you have a proper large screen to have a look at your recorded videos and investigate the published info about your recorded subjects. This rufous woodpecker is such a bird that makes you truly wonder about an unusual interaction and coexisting between predator and its prey and even who is taking over the role as a predator or prey remains unclear sometimes. 
This female Rufus woodpecker, which is best distinguished from this species male by the missing red feathered eye patch, is feasting here on its main food source, Crematogaster, also called acrobat ants. These ants build box like tree nests, but this nest construction seems still at its building stage. Once these nests have reached a proper size suitable enough for a new woodpecker's home, they might be favorized by a pair of rufous woodpeckers within their distribution range to hammer their nest hole right in there. I know this behavior from some trogon species that inhabit termite tree nests in the same way, but it was new to me with woodpeckers. Another female also likes to have a share of this great ant meal, most probably their family members. These acrobat ants are very defensive, but surprisingly do not harm the adult woodpeckers and rarely attack their offspring or their eggs while sharing the same nest even though these ants are feasted on by its self-invited hosts. These woodpeckers' chicks, though, are fed by regurgitated food from their parents. This very special brood biology made them famous, even though they are only locally common, but otherwise uncommon birds throughout their range in South and Southeast Asia. Rufus woodpeckers are divided in 10 subspecies and the Badios is the Bornean one. They occur in open tropical, deditious and evergreen forests, peat swamps, forest jungles, locally scrub mangroves, coastal woods, bamboo plantations and gardens up to 1400 meter in Borneo. When the man of the clan comes in, he clearly marks his feeding place for himself. These woodpeckers mainly forage in pairs, one of the reasons why they are highly vocal to keep contact with its partner when feeding mainly on ants, termites and other insects, fruits, nectar and tree sap. But what a luck I have! These woodpeckers are described to be always on the move and rarely stay at one spot. And they also more pick at their food instead of hammering on the wood. They are not typically heard by the woodpecker's drumming sounds. And this kink is even more brazen. Off with these woodpeckers! My tree! They usually lay two to three eggs, but even up to seven are found as well, which are incubated 12 to 14 days. Now I just filmed the Ruffles Malcoa, and I'm showing you these videos now. Sunbirds are not the only very active birds difficult to film. You can have the same pleasure with trying to focus on follow a large sized Malkoa which clambers through the trees and hops from one branch to another. So I'm having a hard time, and pleasant as well, filming this foraging Ruffles Malkoa female. But she definitely casted a spell on me so I am lucky to be able to observe her catching a large locust, which she swallows eventually as a whole. What an amazing eyesight these birds have, while I nearly overlook all of the insects of the trees I pass by. 
This Ruffles Makua is a remarkable species from the cuckoo family with a strong sexual dimorphism which might not even be truly related to the Makuas. Females are easily recognized in this species due to their black and white tipped tail feathers and their great bluish head and neck feathers. They mainly feed in the middle story of primary pterocarp, evergreen and semi-evergreen, secondary growth and peat swamp forests, on mostly insects, mainly caterpillars, butterflies, cicadas, crickets, beetles, locusts and large spiders, where they creep characteristically through dense vegetation to find their prey often under leaves. Their voice is soft, mournful, cat-like a meow and resembles the dragon's call within its range. They occur in South Myanmar, South Thailand, Peninsula Malaysia, Sumatra and Borneo up to 900 meters. In my previous film I have already presented a greater racket tail drongo for you, but that one was not vocal. And it also had one of its elongated outer tail feathers missing. The subspecies Brachyphorus, which occurs here on Borneo, is lacking the species' typical crest. This is a male white rumped charmer with its regrowing long tail. It was formerly thought to be an own endemic species and was named white crown charmer. But up to date, it is one of the three subspecies of the white rumped charmer occurring in Borneo, of which this one here is Streak Landi that occurs in North Borneo. It lives in forest up to 1200 meter, where it hunts in the understory and forest edges for food. Locals in Borneo continue to breed them as cage birds, greatly valued for their singing abilities and also continue to trap new ones, as it is believed that wild-caught young birds are stronger and better songsters than those in captivity. While I spend most of the daytimes at RDC within the forest, I miss the bee eaters so far, which are commonly found at the RDC forest edge alongside the road where they are selling out for insects from the telephone cables. They feed mainly on honeybees and other hymenopterans, and one of them had just catched here and smashed it several times against the cable, most probably to get rid of the bee's poison. They also prey on flies, beetles and bugs that might even be as long as 42 mm. The car parking area with its flowering bushes is a great spot to observe several types of sunbirds. This olive-backed sunbird male is the sunbird with most probably the largest distribution of all sunbirds. They roughly occur from southern China and Southeast Asia south to Queensland and Australia and the Solomon Islands and occurred in different habitats and have well adapted to humans. The subspecies Ornatus is the one present here in Borneo. Nectar is its main food, but they will also feed on insects, especially when feeding their young. 
This crimson sunbird male is belonging to the sunbird species that is most likely to be seen in its distributed range in Southeast Asia that is roughly described from India to the Philippines and Sulawesi. It is mainly found at forest edges and tall secondary growths and plantations where it largely feeds on nectar from favorited red and pink flowers and some insects and spiders as well. Are these flowers contributing to their red plumage? Compared to the very colorful sunbird males, it is not easy at all to identify sunbird females. Especially when more sunbird species are at the same location. Fortunately, I was able to take some photos of the male of this species, which is a copper-throated sunbird. This female is resting in the shade of the midday sun. These sunbirds are generally more found in coastal regions, especially mangroves, where they love to drink nectar of Brugiera mangroves. Besides nectar, they also feed on some small arthropods. This morning I filmed another woodpecker and clicked my woodpecker number 5 and also clicked the kingfishes for you. In these videos I will show you now. If you don't have chicken cocks around you to wake you up, you can definitely get a good wake-up call by a colored kingfisher male. It's one of the most common of all the kingfishers in the world, distributed from the African coast of the Red Sea through to Tonga and Samoa that predominantly lives in the coastal parts of its range. Of the 50 recognized subspecies, the Laubmanianus is the one that occurs in Borneo and Sumatra and its satellite islands. They used to live in a pair where they occupy territories of about 4 hectares in which they often raise two broods a year. A good spot to watch out for spider hunters at dusk and dawn are tree canopies, especially high branches without leaves. Most probably individual males sing from there, as I have never seen them in a pair. Spectacled spider hunters are thought to be monogamous and occur in different forest types from Malay Peninsula to Sumatra and Borneo up to 1000 meter. This is a subspecies Pluto that is found here on Borneo and it's a male, which is black and white colored, while this species females are grey and white colored. They have a quite variant diet, feeding on insects, notably crickets and other vertebrates, geckos, leeches, centipedes and even fish as well as flower nectar. This is our last day in the Sepilok forest area and we're heading back today to KK with another short birding tomorrow for some parrots. And it was a really, really amazing time here and I really hope to be back here one day. It's raining on our way back to KK and we are lucky since so far only one of our trip days was partly rainy. I must admit, I have never seen anything like this house fronts and balconies fully shit under bird poop. This is what you can say. It's city birding. It's amazing. All those swift bats here are <laughs> making a big mess on the houses and they fly with thousands, I would say, just above us. <laughs> amazing. 
Now in many parts of Southeast Asia, caves are empty where swiftlets used to nest, as people have domesticated them to their cities. It's like the starlings in Rome. So this is my last birding spot in Saba. Um, I'm in a very nice park. Unfortunately, at the moment, it's a little bit polluted. And the bigger thing to worry about is that this park will be destroyed fully by the government to put here most probably some hotel construction. This park is a perfect place for some parrots to live, which are actually not from here but from the Philippines. It seems that one guy ever brought some pairs and he released them back in the wild here. So um, they're flying all around here, they're doing quite well. But no one actually knows when the government is building all their constructions here where the parrots will go to, where will they find their food and uh, where will they have any suitable place to survive. This is directly at the beach. It's uh, actually a pleasant area here for the people to come and to relax. A typical shorebird found in many regions in Asia is this Pacific Reef egret. I will stay there all night to fly on next morning and we are a little bit smoked now. Seems like we have too many bacteria. <laughs> Looking forward to my next trip. This medium-sized egret has an unusual non-sexual plumage dimorphism, with some species being entirely white and others being charcoal grey plumaged. It's my last bird I'm filming for you from my fabulous first trip to Borneo. I hope I will be able to visit this island with its unique flora and fauna soon again. Try to minimize your consumption of products which contain palm oil if you want to support Borneo's last strongholds for its unique endemic wildlife. <laughs>